Man, uh, if you notice, I have uh, tissue in my hand. When we were doing a little walkthrough and, you know, kind of making sure I knew where to stand when I came up here, I've never gotten an opportunity or this is my first opportunity to preach here. I had this, and I mean, I'm weeping and bawling because of where I was standing here. Sat there, sat up there, sir. So many different ways. I'm going to try to get through this first part without that. But just, just to tell you who I am, my name is Pastor Derek McNeil, and like Matt said, I am now the lead pastor of Nations United Church. Yeah. It, it's, it's a church plant in Cypress, Texas. Again, we started here, and like literally almost to the day, I think it was August 10th of 2003, that my wife and I gave our commitment to be members here at the Met Church. And we, we've done some of everything that this church has given us in ministry. If you've been here long enough, you'll probably remember we did faith training where we would go out and do evangelism. We would literally knock on your door and we would come and ask you, man, in your own personal opinion, what do you think it takes to get to heaven? And then we would walk you through an evangelistic approach to make sure that your faith was secure in God. And so I just thank God it's a surreal moment to be able to come back here and to offer you what God has given me. But just to kind of bring you to where I am, on March the 5th of 2021, I'm doing my regular devotional, and I'm spending time with God that morning. It was a Tuesday, and I'm reading in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 6, 7, and 8. And Moses is speaking to the children of Israel, and he makes this phrase. He says, and the Lord said to us, And in that moment, it was like God, now I'm going to date myself a little bit, but it's like God had pressed the pause and the play button, you know, if you know back in the day when you would pause your recorder, right? So he said, pause. And he said, Derek, I'm about to speak something into your spirit, and I need you to listen at me because I don't want you to miss it. And I know it was just a few seconds, but it seemed like an eternity. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening. I'm like, okay, God, what is it you have for me to hear from you? And then he says, and he continues, he says to the children of Israel, you have dwelt at this mountain long enough. Now turn and take your journey. And when I heard that, I mean, again, I'm a leaker. If you know me, I cry. So, so, so I'm weeping again because God had told me clearly in that phrase, you have dwelt at this mountain, this assignment, this position that I've given you long enough Now, I need you to go take your journey. And thusly, the call to plant Nations United Church was born. And so what we're going to do today, however, just I just kind of wanted to introduce myself to you guys. We have um, 18 partners with us at Nations United Church. They'll be here, the majority of them, on the next service. But we are a disciple-making church. Have y'all heard that before? Yeah, we are a disciple-making church. Our mission statement is to make and send disciples and churches who love, live, and lead like Jesus. And that's what we've done. We cut our teeth on that aspect right here. I remember attending my first DS1 and my mind being blown that I had been a a follower of Christ for a number of years, like basically my whole life, okay? Okay. My mother brought my brother up in church, and, and I, we were in church every time the doors opened. So it was not new to me, but it was only probably about 10 years ago when relational discipleship was introduced right here at this church. Changed my life completely. Went from sitting in a pew to serving in kids' ministry as their onstage host. And, and, and doing those things and then becoming a small group member, leaving that position to become a small group leader, uh, then becoming a small group coach right here at the Met, and then finally going out to Sci Life, used to be the Met Cypress, as their small group's pastor. And then, as I said, God gave me a vocational calling uh, to lead a church. Now, if we're a disciple-making church, and I know we are, I know the seasons that we're in right now. Because again, I came from here, I went to Sci Life, and we, we have this same DNA about disciple making. So right now, if you don't know, y'all, y'all know, anybody, anybody follow football in here? Yeah, right? We're from Texas, so we should have one or two hands go up, right? 
But right now, what's going on in the season? Where are we at right now? Right now, we got preseason training camp, right? These are things that these professional athletes that have been playing ball since they were in kindergarten, Pee Wee, Pop Warner League, they had to come back in a few months ago, and what did they have to do? Go back to the basics. They had to get back in training camp and do some of the very same tackling drills that they've been doing their whole life. Now, they, they've been doing it for 10, 12, 14 years, and now they're on a professional stage. You would think they know it by now, right? That's what one might say. And I guarantee you many of those veterans probably don't want to go to training camp each year. When it gets closer, they get this antsy feeling in their stomach like, hey, it's training camp time. But they, I can tell you this, I guarantee you to a person, not one of them would forego training camp before the season started. Not one of them would say, hey, coach, let's just opt out of training camp and the basics and let's just start the season because they know the importance of training camp. Teachers, any teachers in the building? Yeah, I used to teach school. I taught kindergarten, first and second grade for 12 years, right? Yeah, yeah. And I, I used to get this pit in my stomach right around this time of year. I walk into Walmart and I look up and they, got, they have, and Kroger and all these different places, they have a school list that comes out. And if you know you've been a teacher, just about the time you get out of teaching mode during the summer and you walk into Walmart and you look up, there it is, teacher list. But what are the teachers doing right now? They're going back and they're doing pre-service or in-service training, professional development training. They do it because they know it's important if they're going to be successful as a teacher. And then right now, my wife and I and uh, many of our church members from New Church, we just attended a discipleship training for leaders. Uh, we partnered with Side Life and they call it Discipleship Collective. And so we got all of our group leaders and apprentices together. You guys do something similar here with your cadres, your leadership cadres, and Rick takes you guys through the leaders. Some of you all have attended the DS, right? All of those things are done to prepare us for what is coming up. And I know the season that you're in. We're coming to the end of August and September comes. And if you don't know, if you're watching online, if you're just visiting, we generally launch our new discipleship season in September. Yeah, get ready for that. It's coming. And so what I want to do for us today is I want, to, I want to take us back to the basics. What I talked to you about briefly today, it's not going to be prayerfully, not anything that you've not heard before. But just like those professional players, it's something that you will hear over and over and over again. How many of y'all are familiar with Matthew 28, 18 through 20? Yeah. Some of us call it that we know it as the Great Commission. And it says this, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And here it is. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And then he goes on to say, teaching them to observe or keep all that I've commanded. And he says, I am with you always, even to the ends of the earth. Now get this, he's telling you that I'm not going to go anywhere. I'm going to be with you the whole time. He's saying, I have all authority, every authority that is in existence, I have. Because if he has all, then no one else has room for any other, right? He says, I have it in heaven and I have it on earth. And because of that, I am now telling you, those that follow me, my disciples, to go now and make disciples of all nations. And so many of us understand that commission. But here's the question. God, I, I believe you. I know your mission is to make disciples. But help me understand, God, what is a disciple? And so we're going to spend a few minutes just really discussing what it is a, disi what it is a disciple. What is that? Now, if you've been here, I'm not going to quiz you. But if you've been here a while, you ought to know this. I'll tell you, I'll go ahead and tell you, it's Matthew 4, 19, right? Matthew 4, 19 says, Jesus is speaking, and he's calling two of his disciples, and he says to them this, 
Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Right now here at this church, at Nations United Church, at Side Life Church, we carry the same definition of what a disciple is. And we get it from Matthew 4, 19. Jesus says again, come follow me. And he says, I, him, Jesus, will make you, which means that you currently are not, but there is some process that needs to happen. He said, I will make you fishers of men. And we know that the fishers of men is synonymous with being a disciple maker. And I want to just camp on that. Fisher of men is synonymous with being a disciple maker, right? Not just a follower, because in, at its lowest form or lowest sense, a disciple is one who follows. But he said, if you follow me, I will make you something very specifically. You will become a disciple maker, not only just a follower, a disciple of me, but you will intentionally, on purpose, with a purpose, develop that spiritual maturity in someone else and then send them to then go make disciples. So for me, you know, it's in the invite. I cannot believe it. It's in the invite. Listen what happens. God is asking us to follow him. I want you to get your head wrapped around that. It never ceases to amaze me that this very same command given to the original disciples by God's only son, the Messiah, the Savior of the world, God's anointed king, is chronicled in his book for us to now look at it and read and get that same invite. I know Pastor Rick spoke about it last week, and he said, God, with this, in his incomparable power, he who sits high above everything, his power exceeds the highest form of excellence. This is who's saying directly to you, follow me. This is what he's saying, follow me. And if you do that, I'm going to show you, I will make you a fisher of men. So many times in Scripture, when he gathered his disciples around the masses that followed him, he offered that invitation to them in Matthew 8, verse 21 through 22, when some of the men were asking about uh, what that meant and asking about being his disciples, he said to them, simply, follow me. We see it again in Matthew chapter 9 when he finds Matthew, a tax collector, in his booth, and he tells Matthew, follow me. So now we got it. We know what the mission is. It's to make disciples. We understand a disciple is one who follows Christ, who's being changed by Christ, and who's committed to the mission of Christ. But now, what exactly is this disciple? How do I become that? What does it mean, Father God, to follow you? The question again, what does it mean to follow Christ? And I'm going to give you a few things that, so you can get your head wrapped around it. And as I said before, there's going to be things that you hear that in my mind, I pray that you go, oh, yeah. Maybe over the year you kind of dulled in, in your understanding or remembrance of what it is. So now you'll hear me say these things and you go, oh, yeah, jot it down. Just put a little highlight over it. Maybe you've written it down somewhere. But some of you might be for the first time going, aha, new learning, new discovery. Whichever one it is, it's okay. But this is what God has given me. Following Jesus, first of all, means leaving some things behind to follow him in a brand new life. If we're going to follow Christ as his disciples that are growing in maturity to be a disciple maker, we're going to have to leave some things behind. It means you have to leave a life behind that you have planned for yourself. Because when I woke up that morning, that, that, that Tuesday morning around 9.30 a.m., I didn't go to bed the night before thinking that, God, you're going to make me a lead pastor. Had no idea. But when he spoke to me, I had to leave behind a comfortable position 
as a small groups pastor, as adult ministries pastor at a church that I absolutely love and adore, that I've seen growth in people and I've developed deep abiding relationships with, Yet God says, you're going to have to leave that alone and behind and go where I tell you to go. Where is that? I don't know, but he, I went. He said, go, and I went. Sometimes you're going to have to leave behind a life that is comfortable for you. I am comfortable coming to church. I'm comfortable getting a word from the pastor. I'm comfortable hearing a beautiful a rendition of song. But I I don't know about that discipleship thing. I don't know if I can follow you that closely, Lord. But if we're going to follow him, we're going to have to leave behind some things. Your life is not about what you can achieve here on earth, but it's what you store up in heaven. You're leaving behind your old way of life to follow Jesus in a brand new new kind of life. So the first thing, following Jesus means you're going to have to leave behind some things. Secondly, following Jesus means seeking him in his word, the Bible. We cannot succinctly follow Christ without this or your phone or your tablet or your device. That's fine. But we cannot get around following Christ without finding him in scripture. If you ask yourself this, like, If you say follow Jesus, he's no longer walking on this earth with us. The disciples had the benefit when he said, hey, follow me. They literally had to drop their nets in some cases. They literally had to allow others to bury their dead because he said, follow me, and they began that journey. But now, where do we find him to follow him? In the living word of God. So if we're going to follow Jesus, be his disciples, we got to get in the book. In this book that I read and I I share and I disciple other guys through, it's called The Divine Mentor. Wayne Cordero says this. He said, the unambiguous source for the Christian, that which fuels, ignites, guides, sustains, and empowers absolutely everything, is time with the Master. Every, the thing that sustains God, ignites, fuels, and empowers absolutely everything is time with the master. Quiet, reverent, unhurried moments in the presence of Christ. The Bible tells us that if we seek him, we'll find him. If we knock, the door will be open unto us. When we study his word, we learn of his promises to us. We learn about his relentless love for us. And we also learn what he expects of us as his followers. We discover that God loves us beyond measure. We experience his faithfulness as followers of Christ. Third, following Jesus means building a relationship with him through prayer. How many of y'all understand the power of prayer? Oh my goodness, if you don't get to know him. This is where you spend time in dialogue with the creator of the world. He desires to be in close relationship with you. I know we could come up here and we could pray these eloquent uh, spoken prayers and, you know, we can wax eloquent and speak and give these long withdrawn prayers, but all he wants is your conversation. He said, if you follow me, I want to be in relationship with you and you can talk to me. And I will listen to you having personal dialogue. It's a conversation that goes both ways. When we pray, we have access to God's presence and his power. When we pray, we have access to God's presence and his power. So many times in our relationship, we limit ourselves because we don't take time to pray. If you want to know him, you want to follow him, you want to be in right relationship with God, pray. Fourth, following Jesus means worshiping him. And I heard Matt say it just before I came out. Worshiping him in spirit and in truth. So that doesn't mean just kind of uh, acknowledge him when you get up in the morning or maybe when you eat, you know, you say a quick prayer, Lord, bless this food about to receive for the nourishment of my body. 
Christ's name we pray. Amen. Dig in. Yeah, he wants to hear from us in everything, but he wants us to really, truly worship him, offering authentic and true praise. If you want to experience the presence of God, I challenge you to worship him. I'll tell you a quick story. When we first came, literally, like I said, about 20 years ago, I grew up in, and I hate to put uh, color schemes on things, but I grew up in what people traditionally call a black Baptist church, 35 years of my life. Loved every bit of it, still do. God is amazing. He speaks in all different areas. But the music here was different 20 years ago than what I was accustomed to. The worship here was different than what I was accustomed to. Sat right up in this area up here, and I remember literally squirming in my seat like, oh my goodness, this, this music is totally different than what I was accustomed to. And I got, I really lost myself and I'm going to be honest, I lost myself in the worship of God because I had my own understanding of what worship should sound like. And so then we, we went to visit another church the week after that. Music was great. The sermon, probably like what you're getting on, I'm not going to say that. <laughs> now, and, and again, I understand God's word goes forth in different ways, but it didn't resonate with me. So now the following week, now the third week, I'm perplexed. Like, what do I do? I mean, what, I asked my wife, well, do we go back to this church? Because the music's the same, but we heard a great word here. And then we came back. I said, well, let's go. Let's give it another shot over here at the Met. And this time the Holy Spirit spoke to me. He said, Derek, I don't want you to pay attention to the melody of the music. He said, I want you to listen at the messaging in the music. He said, when you look at those words, the author that penned the words of this song what was he or she trying to communicate to you about God? And so standing in there about the same places, two weeks removed, squirming in my seat because it wasn't what I was accustomed to, now I'm standing weeping because I'm connecting to God in authentic praise. This is what he asked of us. How do we praise God with authenticity? We praise him with truth and spirit, the spirit and truth. That's how God wants us to praise him. And when we worship God like that, you know what it does? It right-sizes our reverence toward him. When all I can do is take a posture of reverence and worship and think about how awesome our God is, it reminds me of how small I am, yet it also reminds me how much he loves me. The scriptures tell us he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Number five, following Jesus means being in community with other believers. Amen. See, meeting together, building meaningful relationships with other believers allows us to encourage one another and to build each other up every time we're together. It strengthens each other when we're weak. It encourages each other when we're down and depressed. God has given us a community that if we're in communication with him and one another, we're fulfilling all the laws and prophets. Remember what he says, love the Lord, your God, with all your heart, your mind, and your soul. And what did he say the second one was? Love your neighbor as yourself. And so when I'm in relationship with God and I'm in relationship with my other friends and family and believers, then I am following Christ the way he designed me to follow him. If you remember in the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 46 through 47, it says this, So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and of the breaking of the bread, going from house to house, sound like small groups, going from house to house, they ate their food with gladness, and simplicity of heart. And then verse 47 says, praising God and having favor with all people. And here's the part that really that I love the best. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being, and here's the word, saved. When we are in a right relationship with God and we're in fellowship with others, people come to know Christ. They're being saved, not just adding to the number of the church, but he said those were, that were there were being saved daily. People were coming to know God. If we follow Christ, we'll be changed by Christ. I was speaking to someone earlier today. There's not a time 
that we can encounter the presence of God and remain the same. If you have an experience with God that's true and real and authentic, something fundamentally changes in you. Your DNA is beginning to look more and more like him. After all, you're made in the image of God. You are the Imago Dei. He created you in his image. We just have to align ourselves to think about how that change occurs. The sanctification process comes when we follow Christ. Because he said, if you follow me, not you might, there's a possibility. If you follow me, you will. He said, I will make you. The change will come. If you abide in me and I in you, he says, you will bear much fruit. You will see love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. You'll see all of those things being part of who you are. Ephesians chapter 4, 22 through 24. If we're going to be changed, this is what it means. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on a new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. When we earnestly and sincerely follow Christ, we will not remain the same. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And finally, if we follow Christ, the third part of our definition, following Christ, being changed by Christ, committed to the mission of Christ, Following Jesus puts us in that presence. It will cost us something, however, because it says you're going to be committed to the mission of Christ. When Jesus came and he showed us how committed he was to what his father had sent him to do, that he did what? He died. It's going to cost you something to be a disciple maker, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I, I, I like this. I do this, this. There's a breakfast plate analogy that I like to show. I'm a pictures guy. So just imagine this plate of food in front of you. You got uh, bacon and ham and you have eggs over here on the plate. And it looks like a really healthy, good-looking, delectable plate. When I start thinking about the two contributors to that plate, I realize that the chicken was involved, but the pig was committed. Do you follow what I'm saying? The pig had to give his very life that we can enjoy the fruits of that labor. This is what he's asking us. There's some things you got to die to. Man, but if you do, there's good things on the other side for you. So we have to follow Christ, be changed by Christ, and be committed to the mission of Christ. That's what we have to do. Following Jesus does not mean just going to church. We can come to church every Sunday and not follow Jesus at all. I was guilty of it before in my life. I'm sure I'm not the only one. Some of us come here regularly, and we might just maybe say something about the sermon when we leave on the way home to the restaurant. Man, Pastor Matt preached a really good sermon today, didn't he? Oh, yeah, I like this part, and we don't hear it again until the following Sunday. But we're going to be here. We're going to find that same seat that we sat in most of the time, be a little bit upset if somebody beat us to it, But following Jesus does not mean just going to church. Going to church should be a part of following Jesus, but there's much more to it than just that. You can go to church and not be a follower of Jesus. Going to church is not the same as following him. Following Jesus does not mean just believing in who he is. Because you know what it said, that the demons believe who he is and they tremble. But the thing that's different between the demon and us, they have not given their allegiance to Christ. They have not followed him in spirit and in truth. They have not submitted themselves to his authority. If we're going to follow Christ, we can't just believe that he exists. We have to give our very lives for him. Following Jesus did not mean liking him, quote unquote, liking him or his words. How many of us in today's times got Facebook pages, uh, Instagram pages, all the different things. We like everything we see, right? And we got, uh, I got like almost 2,000 friends on Facebook. And some of them I've never met in my life. 
but I call them friends and I like everything that they put on there. Jesus is not like that. He don't want us for likes. He wants us to be authentically involved in his life. In order to follow Christ, the relationship cannot simply be surface-level relationship. God wants us, as you all say here, to be in meaningful relationship with him and each other. Over and over, Jesus told his disciples, follow me. He told Peter one last time in the book of John. He says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? He said, yeah, well, feed my lamb. Peter, do you love me? Yeah, feed my sheep. You know, he did it three times, right? And Peter said that the third time, he said, Father, you know all things. You know that I love you. And he said, well, feed my lamb. And then it goes on maybe two verses down. It said, then he spoke to him, Peter, signifying the death that he would glorify God in. And then when he had spoken this, he said to him again, follow me. Maybe you're here in this place today. And you're kind of like Peter. He was on the right path for a while. And then when it got real hard and it got real sticky, he denied the master three times. And with cursing, remember? And then Jesus went on to his death, was buried and was resurrected. And then he came back and he went and found Peter doing the very same thing that he had been doing before fishing. And he says, follow me. Maybe you're in this place and you say to yourself, you know, I, I, I get it, I want to follow, but you just don't know the things that I've done. You just don't know how far I've strayed away from God. That doesn't matter to him. The invitation is still open, follow me. Don't worry about all the other stuff. I will make you, I will change you, and I will put your mission with me. He has more than just spectating from the seats. He has more than just shading in the tech department. I used to do that when I was here. I was a shader. That was my role. If Pastor Sal at the time was running hot, shade him down. I just twist the knob, but I was faithful. But he showed me, Derek, that's much more than you than just that. I'm going to tell you, it's more than just you leading a small group for you small group leaders. That's not it. And maybe if you're in here, I know we say it all the time, join a group, join a group, join a group. But guess what? It's way more than just joining the group. That's, that's the vehicle by which we believe disciples are having best, but that's not the end all be all. He has more than just preaching a sermon. He has more than just being a lead pastor at a church. He's inviting all of us to follow him and be made disciple makers. God is inviting you into relationship with him, to believe in him, to be changed by him, and then one day to be on mission with him. Will you accept his invitation? Let me pray. Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your son, Jesus. You are an amazing, awesome God. God, the fact that you allow us an opportunity to be in your presence, although we squandered it in the garden, God, you had already made a way for us to come back into right relationship with you. God, if we can confess with our mouths and believe in our hearts that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that on the third day you raised him to walk, Father God, with all power and all authority in his hands, and now he's on your right side interceding for us. God, all we have to do is confess it and believe it. And then, God, don't just stop there, but then to follow you, to give our lordship to you, to have a complete gospel, now to take your message that the only way to you is through your son Jesus, to a lost and dying world. God, remind us of the basics. Let us be prepared to do the work that you've given us to do. And if you've never done that, they're going to be prayer partners somewhere along this way. Come to them. Confess to them, God, I need Jesus as my Savior. Can you walk with me through that? Can not only you help me become saved, but now can you put me with people that would allow me to grow to spiritual maturity? Because I want to be a disciple maker. I want to be changed and I want to go into a world and bring someone else to you. God, do that for me. I will love you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. So as we uh, close today, why don't you stand with me? I'm going to ask our prayer volunteers to make their way to where they are. We're almost done. Um, but whatever it is that you, you feel impressed by the Holy Spirit, you know, this is what responding for me would look like. 
Maybe you do need to come give your life to Jesus. Maybe you need to pray to receive him as Savior and Lord. You need to surrender your heart fully. Maybe you need to take that first step of obedience, which is to declare that publicly by being baptized, and you need to sign up for baptism. Maybe you need to quit coming in and out, and you need to get involved. You need to serve in some capacity. You need to join a relational small group. There are plenty of next steps for each and every one of us here. What is God asking of you? What is God asking of you? So just in the quietness of this moment, before I dismiss this, I want you to close your eyes and bow your heads. Just out of reverence for Christ, respect for the people around you, just keep your eyes closed. If you need to respond to the voice of the Holy Spirit right now, I want you to step out. If you need to take the hand of the person next to you, that's fine. Just step out from the aisle where you are and come forward. If you're watching online, you can engage us right there on the chat. You can do it that way too. People moving already. You just, let's just, if that's not you right now, then I want you to pray for somebody that you know who needs to respond to Jesus. Let's get in the habit of responding when the Holy Spirit speaks. We'll take a moment and wait here. Father, we commit in this place today that as we walk out of here, we recognize we've been communicated with very clearly what's available to us as followers. God, give us a conviction of our spirit. Help remind us that obedience is the posture that you ask. Give my brothers and sisters in this place the courage to follow you even more deeply, more fully, whatever they are called to lay aside, whatever it is that you're calling them to put down, whatever it is you're calling them to pick up, give them the courage, God, to be people, men and women, who respond to the voice of their Heavenly Father by his Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Hey, can we tell Derek thank you one more time for bringing the word today? Hey, thank you for being a church that celebrates that. Thank you. Thank you. It's not about me or Scott or anybody else. It's about our Father. It's a beautiful thing to watch. The, uh, the chicken was involved. The pig was committed. I will be stealing that. I will be stealing that. I heard a pastor this week said, hey, a lot of people like to be considered martyrs, but very few like to die. So whatever it is that God's calling you to die to this week, Walk in confidence that he's with you. He's guiding you every step of the way. He's got something great planned for you this week. Follow him with your whole being, all right? Hey, Met Church, who's got it better than us? All right, we'll see you next time. Take care.